I am come. I am come once again from the tomb in return for the ring which you gave. That I am thine, and that thou art mine, this nuptial pledge receive. He lay like a corse neath the demon's force, and she wrapped him in a shroud, and she fixed her teeth in his heart beneath, and she drank of the warm life blood. And ever and anon murmured the lips of stone, Soft and warm is this couch of thine, thou to tomorrow be laid in a colder bed. Albert, that bed will be mine. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal. There where the vines cling crimson on the wall. And in the twilight, wait for what will come. The leaves will whisper there of her, and some, like flying words, will strike you as they fall. But go, and if you listen, she will call. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies to rift the fiery night that is in your eyes. But there, where western glooms are gathering, the dark will end the dark, if anything. God slays himself with every leaf that flies, and hell is more than half of paradise. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies, in eastern skies. Out of a grave I come to tell you this, out of a grave I come to quench the kiss that flames upon your forehead with a glow that blinds you to the way that you must go. Yes, there is yet one way to where she is, bitter, but one that faith may never miss. Out of a grave I come to tell you this, to tell you this. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. There are the crimson leaves upon the wall. Go, for the winds are tearing them away. Nor think to riddle the dead words they say, nor any more to feel them as they fall. But go, and if you trust her, she will call. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. My dear young maiden clingeth unbending, fast and firm to all the long-held teaching of a mother ever true. As in vampires, on mortal folk on Theses' portal, Heidegg-like, do believe. But my Christine, thou dost dally and wilt my loving parry till I myself avenging to a vampire's health a drinking, him toast in pale toque. And as softly thou art sleeping, to thee I shall come creeping, and thy life's blood drain away. And so shalt thou be trembling, for thus shall I be kissing and death's threshold thou'lt be crossing with fear in my cold arms. And last shall I thee question. Compared to such instruction, what are a mother's charms?
She writhed in anguish, like a serpent within the flames, kneading her breasts behind her corset's shiny busk in Delphic madness. Yet from her strawberry mouth fell strains so soft, words potent as her intoxicating musk. My, my lips are damp with love. Come, let me show you the art of smothering gloomy conscience in these satin sheets. Rest all your cares on these prize-winning paps. Take heart. Many an old man has found his youth between these teats. No sun, no moon, no star can long retain their allure for him who sees me nude, wrapped only in my hair. My professor, I am so adept at pleasure that when I press my lovers to my bosom where I, blushing, yield my breasts to their impassioned bites, demure yet debauched, fragile yet robust, this mattress swoons in shame beneath our lustful rites, and impotent seraphim would damn themselves for this buzz. When she had drawn from my bones the last of the marrow, I turned to her, now feeble and lost in black torpor, to give a grateful kiss, and saw a shriveled torso and limbs and face from which fell pus and clotted gore. I shut my eyes, fear chill as death crept over me. I swooned. When I reopened them in the glare of day, I saw no vampire. No supple sleeping effigy of my love now lately glutted on my veins, Claret. Instead, a skeleton's bleached bones racked with ague. From their demise arose a rasping, shrill and bitter as an ancient weather vane or tin sign that through a raging winter night bewails its friendless torture. A lily in a twilight place, a moonflower in the lonely night, strange beauty of a woman's face of wildflower white, the rain that hangs a star's green ray slime on a leaf point's restlessness is not so glimmering green and gray as was her dress. I drew her dark hair from her eyes, and in their deeps beheld a while such shadowy moonlight as the skies of hell may smile. She held her mouth up, redly wan and burning cold. I bent and kissed such rosy snow as some wild dawn makes of a mist. God shall not take me from that hour when round my neck her white arms clung, when neath my lips, like some fierce flower, her white throat swung. Or words she murmured while she leaned, which words she holds me softly by, the spell that binds me to a fiend until I die. She rose among us where we lay, she wept, we put our work away. She chilled our laughter, stilled our play, and spread a silence there. And darkness shot across the sky, and once and twice we heard her cry, and saw her lift white hands on high, and toss her troubled hair. What shape was this who came to us, with basilisk eyes so ominous, with mouth so sweet, so poisonous, and tortured hands so pale? 
We saw her wavering to and fro, Through dark and wind we saw her go, Yet what her name was did not know, And felt our spirits fail. We tried to turn away, But still above we heard her sorrow thrill, And those that slept they dreamed of ill and dreadful things, Of skies grown red with rending flames, and shuddering hills that cracked their frames, of twilight's fowl with wings, and skeletons dancing to a tune, and cries of children stifled soon, and over all a blood-red moon, a dull and nightmare sighs. They woke and sought to go their ways, yet everywhere they met her gaze, her fixed and burning eyes. Who are you now? We cried to her. Spirit so strange, so sinister. We felt dead winds above us stir, and in the darkness heard a voice fall, singing cloying sweet, heavily dropping through that heat, heavy as honeyed pulses beat, slow word by anguished word. And through the night strange music went, with voice and cry so darkly blent, we could not fathom what they meant, save only that they seemed to thin the blood along our veins, foretelling vile, delirious pains, and clouds divulging blood-red rains upon a hill undreamed. And this we heard. <laughs> Who dies for me, he shall possess me secretly. My terrible beauty he shall see, and slake my body's flame. But who denies me, cursed shall be, and slain, and buried loathsomely, and slimed upon with shame. <laughs> Darkness fell, and like a sea of stumbling deaths we followed, we who dared not stay behind. There all night long beneath a cloud we rose and fell, we struck and bowed, we were the plowman and the plowed. Our eyes were red and blind. And some, they said, had touched her side before she fled us there, and some had taken her to bride, and some had lain down for her and died. Who had not touched her hair ran to and fro, and cursed and cried and sought her everywhere. Her eyes have feasted on the dead, and small and shapely is her head, and dark and small her mouth they said, and beautiful to kiss. Her mouth is sinister and red, as blood and moonlight is. Then poets forgot their jeweled words, and cut the sky with glittering swords, and innocent souls turned carrion birds to perch upon the dead. Sweet daisy fields were drenched with death, the air became a charnel breath, pale stones were splashed with red. Green leaves were dappled bright with blood, and fruit trees murdered in the bud. And when at length the dawn came, green as twilight from the east, and all that heaving horror ceased, silent was every bird and beast, and that dark voice was gone. No word was there, no song, no bell, no furious tongue that dreamed to tell, only the dead who rose and fell above the wounded men, and whisperings and wailings of pain blown slowly from the wounded grain, blown slowly from the smoking plain, and silence fallen again. Until
until at dusk from God knows where, beneath dark birds that filled the air like one who did not hear or care, under a blood-red cloud an aged plowman came alone, and drove his share through flesh and bone, and turned them under to mold and stone. All night long he plowed. Thou, sharper than a dagger thrust sinking into my plaintive heart. Thou, frenzied and arrayed in lust, strong as a demon host whose art possessed my humble soul at last, made it thy bed and thy domain, strumpet to whom I am bound fast as is the convict to his chain, the stubborn gambler to his dice, the rabid drunkard to his bowl, the carcass to its vermin lice. O oh, thrice accursed be thy soul. I called on the swift sword to smite one blow to free my life of this. I begged perfidious aconite for succor in my cowardice. But sword and poison in my need heaped scorn upon my craven mood, saying, Unworthy to be freed from thine accursed servitude. O oh, fool, if through our efforts fate absolve thee of thy sorry plight, thy kisses would resuscitate thy vampire's corpse for thy delight. Why looks my lord so deadly pale? Why fades the crimson from his cheek? What can my dearest husband ail? The heartfelt cares, O Herman, speak. Why at the silent hour of rest dost thou in sleep so sadly mourn? As though with heaviest grief oppressed, Greece too distressful to be borne. Why heaves thy breast? Why throbs thy heart? O oh, speak, if there be relief, thy Gertrude's solace shall impart, if not at least shall share thy grief. Wan is that cheek which once the bloom of manly beauty sparkling showed. Dim are those eyes in pensive gloom that late with keenest luster glowed. Say why, too, at the midnight hour you sadly pant and tug for breath, as if some supernatural power were pulling you away to death. Restless, though sleeping, still you groan and with convulsive horror start. O Herman, to thy wife make known that grief which preys upon thy heart. O Gertrude, how shall I relate the uncommon anguish that I feel? Strange as severe as this my fate, a fate I cannot long conceal. In spite of all my wonted strength, stern destiny has sealed my doom. The deathful malady at length will drag me to the silent tomb. But say, my Herman, what's the cause of this distress and all thy care, that vulture-like thy vitals gnaws and galls thy bosom with despair? Sure this can be no common grief, sure this can be no common pain, Speak, if this world contain relief, that soon thy Gertrude shall obtain. O Gertrude, tis a horrid cause. O Gertrude, tis unusual care that, vulture-like, my vitals gnaws, and galls my bosom with despair. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but lately he resigned his breath. With others I did him attend unto the silent house of death. For him I wept, for him I mourned, paid all to friendship that was due. But sadly, friendship is returned, thy Herman he must follow too. Must follow to the gloomy grave, in spite of human art or skill. No power on earth my life can save, tis fate's unalterable will. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but now my persecutor foul, 
doth his malevolence extend e'en to the torture of my soul. By night, when wrapped in soundest sleep, all mortals share a soft repose. My soul doth dreadful vigils keep, more keen than which hell scarcely knows. From the drear mansion of the tomb, from the low regions of the dead, the ghost of Sigismund doth roam, and dreadful haunts me in my bed. There, vested in infernal guise, by means to me not understood, close to my side the goblin lies, and drinks away my vital blood, sucks from my veins the streaming life, and drains the fountain of my heart. O oh, Gertrude, Gertrude, dearest wife, unutterable is my smart. When surfeited the goblin dire, with banqueting by suckled gore, will to his sepulchre retire till night invites him forth once more. Then he will dreadfully return, and from my veins life's juices drain, whilst slumbering I with anguish mourn, and toss with agonizing pain. Already I am exhausted, spent, his carnival is nearly o'er, my soul with agony is rent, tomorrow I shall be no more. But, O oh my Gertrude, dearest wife, the keenest pangs hath last remained. When dead, I too shall seek thy life, thy blood by Hermann shall be drained. But to avoid this horrid fate, soon as I'm dead and laid in earth, drive through my corpse a javelin straight. This shall prevent my coming forth. O oh, watch me, this last sad night, watch in your chamber here alone. But carefully conceal the light until you hear my parting groan. Then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent shall be tolled, that peal shall ring my passing knell, and Herman's body shall be cold. Then, and just then, thy lamp make bare, the starting ray the bursting light shall from my side the goblin scare and show him visible to sight. The live long night poor Gertrude sat, watching by her sleeping, dying lord. The live long night she mourned his fate, the object whom her soul adored. Then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent sadly told, the then was pealed his passing knell, the hapless Herman he was cold. Just at that moment Gertrude drew from neath her cloak the hidden light, when dreadful she beheld in view the shade of Sigismund. Sad sight. Indignant rolled his ireful eyes that gleamed with wild, horrific stare, and fixed a moment with surprise beheld aghast the enlightening glare. His jaws cadaverous were besmeared with clotted carnage o'er and o'er, and all his horrid hall appeared distant and filled with human gore. With hideous scowl the spectra fled. She shrieked aloud, then swooned away. The hapless Herman in his bed, all pale, a lifeless body lay. Next day in council twas decree urged at the instance of the state, that shuddering nature should be freed from pests like these ere twas too late. The choir then burst the funeral dome where Sigismund was lately laid, and found him, though within the tomb, still warm as life, and undecayed. With blood his visage was disdained, and sanguined were his frightful eyes, each sign of former life remained, save that all motionless he lies. The corpse of Hermann they contrive to the same sepulchre to take, and through both carcasses they drive, deep in the earth, a sharpened stake. By this was finished their career, through this no longer they can roam. From them their friends have naught to fear. Both quiet keep the slumbering tomb.
The bell rope that gathers God at dawn dispatches me as though I drop down the knell of a spent day to wander the cathedral lawn from pit to crucifix, feet chill on steps from hell. Have you not heard? Have you not seen that core of shadows in the tower whose shoulders sway antiphonal carolines launched before the stars are caught and hived in the sun's ray? The bells, I say the bells break down their tower and swing I know not where. Their tongues engrave membrane through marrow my long scattered score of broken intervals, and I, their sexton slave. Oval encyclicals in canyons, heaping the impasse high with choir, banked voices slain. Pagodas, campaniles with reveilles out leaping, O oh, terraced echoes prostrate on the plain. And so it was, I entered the broken world to trace the visionary company of love, its voice an instant in the wind, I know not whither hurled, but not for long to hold each desperate choice. My word I poured, but it was cognate, scored of that tribunal monarch of air whose thighs in bronze's earth strikes crystal word in wounds pledged once to hope, cleft to despair. The steep encroachments of my blood left me no answer. Could blood hold such a lofty tower as flings the question true? Or is it she whose sweet mortality stirs latent power? and through whose pulse I hear, counting the strokes my veins recall and add, revived and sure, the angelus of wars my chest evokes. What I hold healed, original now, and pure, and builds within a tower that is not stone, not stone can jacket heaven, but slip of pebbles, visible wings of silence, sewn in azure circles, widening as they dip the matrix of the heart, lift down the eyes that shrine the quiet lake and swells a tower, the commodious tall decorum of that sky unseals her earth and lifts love in its shower.